Now again, today our webinar is on 802.11 channels and frequency bands, and we're focusing on understanding the channels that are available to us, how we select channels. We'll talk a little bit about auto channel selection and what that is and why it might matter to us and how we need to use it if we're going to use it at all. And so we're going to be going over all of these details about channels today. First of all, a brief update about things going on at CWNP. Uh, the first CWS and CWT certified individuals now exist. So we have people that are holding these certifications and they are well underway. We've got several organizations that are deploying and implementing these internally. And we're really excited about the future with these two new entry level certifications. Additionally, the job task analysis for CWAP and CWDP is scheduled for the last week of March. And so we'll be coming out of that JTA with everything we need to rebuild CWAP and CWDP in the months afterward, so that in the summer we'll see new versions of these certifications being released. So that's the news, and let's get into the topic for today. First of all, what is a channel? An 802.11 channel is a range of frequencies with the defined center frequency. So basically, a channel is a block of radio frequency. And what we do to define the channel is we choose a center frequency and then we use space on either side of the center. So if we're using a 20 megahertz channel, we're gonna use 10 megahertz on either side. If it's an older 22 megahertz channel for the original 802.11 or 802.11b, then it'll use 11 megahertz on either side. These are for our standard 20 megahertz channels. Now, a 40 megahertz channel is just going to aggregate two 20 megahertz channels together, not in the way you might think. So it doesn't necessarily take channel one and channel two. That wouldn't give you 40 megahertz in 2.4 gigahertz because of the way the channels are set up, as we'll see when we look at them in a few moments. But you pick your primary channel. Let's say that's channel one. And then it's going to use the next available 20 megahertz after that primary channel. So anytime you're using something wider than 20 megahertz with modern 802.11 physical layers, you have to have a primary channel. And the reason for that is there may be a client device that's connecting that only supports a 20 megahertz channel. It needs to be able to understand and communicate on that network as well as the devices that can support a 40 megahertz channel. So for example, if you have the painful experience of having an 802.11G client connect to a 40 megahertz 802.11NAP, you will see that that G client only communicates on 20 megahertz because it's all it knows. Now that's gonna be a painful experience for two reasons. The first reason is going to be a painful experience is because you're using a 40 megahertz channel in 2.4 gigahertz, which should never be done. And we'll talk more about that later on. The second reason it's gonna be painful is that 802.11g client is going to have to communicate more slowly. So let's take that into the five gigahertz world and say we have a 40 megahertz channel in five gigahertz. And you've got an 802.11a device that only supports 20 megahertz channels. That 802.11a device is going to slow down everybody. Now, why is that? Because while that 802.11a device is talking, no one else can talk on the channel. And so since that's the case, and since it's using the narrower 20 megahertz channel, the end result is that based on its highest data rates and the limited channel width it's using, it's going to communicate more slowly. So it'll take longer. Let's say you have an 802.11a client that's using the exact same application as an 802.11n client. The N client using the exact same application, sending the exact same packets across the network is going to get them across the wireless channel faster than the 802.11a client because it can achieve higher data rates. Now, of course, we're speaking generally, it's possible the 11n client is very far away from the access point and the 11a client is closer, so it ends up having a higher data rate, but we're talking about you know, all things being equal. And so it's important to understand that even if you use a wider channel, there could still be devices that require a narrower channel. And this continues to be true for 80 megahertz channels in 802.11ac. If you have an 802.11n client, it can only use up to a 40 megahertz channel. So once again, we're in the same scenario. Now, 
the way these are built then is with these chunks of 20 megahertz. So this continues with 80, 160. Notice they're all divisible by 20 megahertz because this is the way it's going to function. Now, a client device with a single adapter can be connected to one channel at a time. So you will not see your typical laptop or tablet or something like that that could be connected to both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz at the same time. So there's no dual concurrent connections in most client devices. There can be exceptions to that, but that's the general rule. An AP, though, will have multiple radios and can offer multiple channels at the same time. So there may be one 2.4 gigahertz channel and one 5 gigahertz channel or there may be two 5 gigahertz channels. Those would be the common deployments that we see with APs today. One 2.4, one 5, or two 5. We rarely see APs deployed with only 2.4 gigahertz capabilities today. The newest of APs, almost all, are dual band APs, meaning that they can support 2.4 and 5 gigahertz at the same time. And again, we have the newer APs now that have one of those radios being configurable to be a 5 gigahertz or 2.4 gigahertz, and then the other is usually a static 5 gigahertz radio. So that gives you kind of an overview of a channel and some of the issues there. Now let's talk about 2.4 gigahertz channels. The 2.4 gigahertz band is from 2400 to 2500 megahertz. Now, we don't use all of that for our 802.11 channels. Even if you're using channel 14, which is not allowed anywhere outside of Japan, you're still not using all of that space. And this is simply because we do leave some space at the top and the bottom of the band. So even if you look at channel 1, notice it's centered on 2,412 megahertz or 2.412 gigahertz. Now, if you do the math and you subtract even 11 for an older 802.11b channel, you're still at 2401 as the low end. So there's a megahertz there we're still not using. So you can see there's even padding at the low end, and then there's more padding at the high end as well. So that helps us to prevent leaking outside of the band beyond the rules of regulatory organizations like the FCC and so forth. Now, the key thing in 2.4 gigahertz is to know that the channels are spaced 5 megahertz apart. So remember, a channel is defined by its center frequency, and then it uses 10 megahertz on either side or 11 megahertz on either side. Now, separated by 5 megahertz, you run into an interesting problem. Channel 1 and channel 2. Channel 1 is 2412. Channel 2 is 2417. Now, if you take 2417 and you subtract 10, what do you get? You get 2407, which is even below the center frequency of channel 1. So channel 2 steps all over channel 1. Channel 2 steps all over channel 3. Channel 3 steps all over channel 2, and so forth. Even channel 3 would be 2, 4, 2, 2, right? So 10 megahertz up from 2, 4, 1, 2. So 2, 4, 2, 2 is the center frequency of channel 3. Subtract 10, what do you get? You get 2, 4, 1, 2. So we're at least at the minimum invading the top half of the space of channel 1. Channel 4, then, would be 2427. Subtract 10, you get 2417, right? Guess what? That's the top of channel 1. Okay? So, you, you see that even channel 4 is still stepping on it. And this is the issue we have. And this is why you see these green channels, 1, 6, and 11, because they don't step on each other. Now, obviously, if I turn channel 6 up to 1 watt of output power, the sidebands are going to encroach on channel 1 and channel 11. But a properly deployed AP with the right output power level, with enough space between APs, we're not going to have any interference of a significant level between channel 1 and channel 6, or channel 6 and channel 11, certainly between channel 1 and channel 11. Now, it is important to know, though, that if someone says, all right, which of the following two channels are non-overlapping in 2.4 gigahertz? 1 and 5, 2 and 9, or 6 and 10? Well, the answer is 2 and 9. 2 and 9 are not overlapping, right? So we say 1, 6, and 11 is what you should use, but there are other channels that can be used. You can use channel 3 and channel 10. They're not going to be overlapping. You could use channel 4 and channel 11. They're not going to be overlapping. I'm not telling you to do that. There's a reason for it, but 
non-overlapping simply means they don't step on each other's space, okay? Now, why am I not telling you to do it? Well, there are all kinds of reasons, but one of the major reasons is in an enterprise deployment, we need the ability to reuse frequencies. So it's called channel reuse or frequency reuse, uh, channel efficiency, frequency efficiency. All of these terms refer to the way we're using the available frequency space that's there for us. By using 1, 6, and 11, I can put an AP on channel 1 and then 20 meters away, an AP on channel 6, 20 meters away, an AP on channel 11, and then I can reuse channel 1 again. Okay, so by using those staggered channels or what's called a multiple channel architecture, I can reuse these channels by spacing them out some distance among them. Now, remember, we don't live in a linear space where we're just going down a hallway or something. At least I hope that's not how you're deploying your APs. But instead, we live in a real world where you have a floor plan, right? And you might have channel one in one office room and then channel six in the room next to it and channel one in the room, uh, uh, rather channel 11 in the room across the hall. And then you have to reuse channel one across the hall in the lower portion. You get the point. So we're going to stagger these. All right. So one, six, and 11 are the non-overlapping channels. Let me answer a question. Is there ever a reason to use something other than one, six, and 11? Well, some people have had good luck in some scenarios using 1, 5, 10, and 13 in regulatory domains that allow it. Some will use 1, 6, 11, and 13, and then they'll just try to keep 13 away from 11 as much as they can. So certainly people use other channels, but there are issues with that. Uh, for example, if you're in a multi-tenant facility and you try to use some kind of a model like that, you're really going to exacerbate the problem. Additionally, if you are in a regulatory domain that allows, say, channel 13, and you use it, then you have the dilemma of what happens when someone flies in on business from a regulatory domain that doesn't allow it, and the only AP that's covering their space is channel 13. So they're unable to actually access it, or they're going off in the distance to some AP on channel 1 that isn't giving them a good signal strength. So these are factors you just have to consider when planning your channels. Now, I said 40 megahertz is bad. Let's talk about why. So if we have a 40 megahertz channel, it looks kind of like if we center it on 2412 for the primary channel, so we're using channel one as our primary channel and a 40 megahertz channel, you can see that it encroaches all the way up to channel six. If we do it on channel six, and then our secondary channel is the next 20 megahertz instead of the previous 20 megahertz, it encroaches all the way up on channel 11. And so we really, as you can see, only have enough space in the 2.4 gigahertz frequency band to run one 40 megahertz channel at a time. And because of that, we can't really implement this staggered channel plan or this multiple channel architecture that we talked about. So 40 megahertz, while it might be tempting to say, oh, look, I can get higher data rates with 40 megahertz channels with my 802.11n clients. You can, but the trade-off doesn't come through for you. So in other words, you don't end up getting overall better throughput because of that decision. Instead, you get overall poorer throughput because of that decision. And that's your goal when you're doing enterprise deployments. Well, let me rephrase that. It's not your goal to get poorer throughput. The goal is to get the best overall performance you can for your stations. So think average throughput capabilities of a station. And this is going to give you a better way of thinking about how you're going to get a well-performing network overall. So if they go home and they live in a house that's 150 feet from their nearest neighbor and they're using 40 megahertz channels and 2.4 gigahertz there, they may say, well, it performs so much better at home. Then the simple thing is don't get into all of the issues of multiple channels and more things like that. Just say, yeah, and you've got, you know, five devices at home. Here we've got 500 or 5,000. So just point out the number of devices you have and know that you're getting better efficiency in 2.4 gigahertz with 20 megahertz channels. Now in 5 gigahertz, things are very different, as you can see from this image. We have different blocks of space available. So we've got a lower range, a middle range, and an upper range. This is how I'm defining them here to keep it simple. And we're going to avoid terminology like uni because it's not necessarily international and global. So the lower range is from 5170 to 5330 megahertz. 
The middle is from about 5490 to 5730, and the upper is from 5735 to uh, 5835. Now, an important thing to know here is not all regulatory domains support all of these ranges, okay? But instead, uh, they may only support the lower range. So you might only have channels 36 through 64 in some regulatory domains. Or you might have 36 to 64 and then 149 to 165. Or 149 to 161 and no support for 165. So these are the kinds of things that are not uncommon. In the middle range here, you actually have other requirements that are important as well. So in the middle range, you have what's called DFS. And also some of the upper portion of the lower range, the last four channels of the lower range may be DFS as well. So DFS is dynamic frequency selection. And what that means is that the, the AP, the network, has to detect if there's radar in the area. And if there is, it has to move away from that channel. So they are therefore dynamic in their frequency selection, dynamic frequency selection. So if let's say it's on channel 118 as a 40 megahertz channel, so that's 116 and 120 combined, right? So it's on channel 118 as a 40 megahertz channel and it detects radar in that space. It's gonna to have to move away. It might jump to 142, it might jump down to 54. It's going to depend on the algorithm that the vendor of the AP has implemented to make that decision. Now they may give you the option to choose what's going to happen with that, but just know that there are realities of that. Now, this is why some people in smaller deployments where they don't need high density and they just need a good, well-performing network that is not massive and does not necessarily have tens of thousands of clients, maybe a few hundred clients or even a couple thousand clients, they'll often use a channel plan where they only use the lower and upper channels. And they do that in order to avoid the DFS channels altogether. So they may only use channels 36 to 48 and 149 to 161 to get full client support, to get support for no DFS issues in their space. And in many environments, you could use 36 to 64 as well as 149 to 161. In some, you may only be able to use 36 to 64. So what does this all come back to? It comes back to regulatory domains, okay? You've got to know what you're allowed to do. Now, the good thing is when you set up an AP and you choose your country, it generally limits you to the channels that are available. And so you're not going to accidentally choose a channel where you're in a violation of local regulation. Now, we do have four different channel widths available in 5 gigahertz now that we have 802.11ac, 20, 40, 80, and 160. Now I've chosen the colors here strategically. I developed this image here several months back and chose to use these colors to really give you a moment of pause. So green means go, right? If you think about a traffic light, green means go, yellow means caution, red means stop, black, the light is out. Okay. There's no light there. It's just darkness. <laughs> so what do I mean by that? Well, uh, 20 megahertz channels, you really don't have to worry a lot. Just use them and plan well. 40 megahertz channels, if you plan well, you can also use them, but you always want to make sure you're asking, am I getting the return on my investment? So yes, you might be boosting the throughput of one or two stations in an area, but are you hurting the throughput of 70 others? So that's an important thing to keep in mind. It's about balance in the design of the network. Uh, in small office deployments, certainly I would say 40 megahertz channels are not going to hurt you in the vast majority of cases. Of course, there can be multi-tenant exceptions and things like that. But if you are your own facility and you're significantly enough separated from other spaces, you can probably get by with 40 megahertz channels with no real worry. And you could probably even just do 38, 46, 151, and 159 and then stagger your channel plan and get by with that in a lot of small office deployments. But when you get into medium and enterprise deployments, you get into larger scale deployments, you're going to have to use a lot of strategy if you use 40 megahertz channels. Your planning will be much easier with 20 megahertz channels, but you may not get the throughput demanded of certain applications. So one strategy that can be used is to say, well, we're going to use 20 megahertz channels and then only in spaces where there's a warrant for higher throughput for some of the stations will we implement 40 megahertz channels. Particularly, again, if it's a large deployment and you really have to balance that overall capability of the wireless network to serve the clients. 80 megahertz channels, I put them red because you should really just stop. There are very few scenarios where you should be using 80 megahertz channels. Notice how few we have. 
even if all of the lower channels are available to us and the upper, that's three. So we're right back to the good old 2.4 gigahertz days, aren't we? We've got three channels that we can stagger in order to implement the 80 megahertz channels. If you can go ahead and use the DFS channels, meaning you just don't ever see any radar events. And keep in mind, you don't have to be near an airport to see these radar events. False positives can be generated. Motors can generate what looks like radar electromagnetic waves. And so the reality is other things can cause them and your AP has to acknowledge that. Otherwise it could be interfering with radar, actual radar. So it's important to really think through the use of those 80 megahertz channels in the consumer space. If the five gigahertz band is fairly clean, I don't have a problem with 80 megahertz channels at all. Even in small business, um, it's not a problem as long as, again, the frequency space is clean enough. Yeah, you can use 80 megahertz channels, not a big deal. In enterprise, a lot more planning would have to go into it, much analysis. Maybe you will find a few zones where you want to use 80 megahertz channels, but by and large, the boost you're going to get from that is so insignificant, and you'll probably find yourself falling back to 40 megahertz channels for most of those scenarios. 160 megahertz channels? I think you can see it's just not an option in the real world. We would have to get significantly more space available to us. Uh, probably we would need another three to 400 megahertz of space where we could build 160 megahertz channels in order to actually use them well. So it is important to keep that in mind. Now you can see the FCC is what defines these channels that I'm looking at here. So 50 and 114, those are the 160 megahertz channels, true 160 megahertz. The IEEE standard also allows for what's called an 80 plus 80. So you could bond 138, 155, for example, try to accomplish it that way. Um, but again, we just don't have the space for 80 megahertz channels. So my general recommendation, I'm sorry, 160 megahertz channels, always stay away from 160 megahertz, almost always stay away from 80 megahertz, and then use 40 megahertz because you need it, not just because you can. Now let's talk about selecting channels then. Uh, the first step is to discover in-use channels within the space. So you need to know what channels are used in that space. Signal strength and channel width. So you need to know what's the signal strength I'm seeing from an existing Wi-Fi channel. What channel width is it using? Wireless LAN scanners can show you this information. Of course, you can use more advanced tools that are called site survey tools, like Ekahal survey tools, uh, Tamo graph, from ComView folks, uh, from Tamosoft rather, that give you ComView for Wi-Fi, uh, Air Magnet Survey Pro, IB Wave Survey Software. All of these are tools that are designed specifically to go in and survey a space. And they will give you really good reports on what's going on in that environment. You want to select a completely non-overlapping channel as much as possible. So that's your first goal. Let me find a completely non-overlapping channel. Sometimes that goal is not possible, especially in 2.4 gigahertz. So then your next option is select the channel that introduces the least co-channel interference as possible. Co-channel interference is when multiple devices in different basic service sets are communicating and can hear each other with sufficient signal strength. So that results in co-channel interference because my clients, my APs can hear the other clients, the other APs in the same channel, but a different BSS. And they have to acknowledge that. They've got to sit there and be silent while those devices are communicating. And that's why it's called co-channel interference. A lot of people like to call it co-channel contention because it really is contention. You're just waiting until your turn to talk. So first option, completely non-overlapping channel. Second option, choose the channel that introduces the least co-channel interference. Limit the number of 2.4 gigahertz channels and encourage the use of five gigahertz channels. So in other words, to diminish CCI, you have to have fewer 2.4 gigahertz channels that are visible. I don't necessarily mean you have to have fewer APs because you can turn the output power down and remove some of the distance of the signal. So remember that. So limit the number of 2.4 gigahertz channels, encourage the use of 5 gigahertz channels. Now there is a feature that you can use in most enterprise gear today called auto channel selection. Auto channel selection is typically very poor in consumer grade equipment. So this is the stuff you go down to your local electronics store and you buy home wireless LAN routers, things like that. Yet they're all pretty well configured to use it. So certainly if you're on this webinar, uh, you have the knowledge to go in and change that. So I would encourage you to do so. Go into those consumer grade devices, 
and pick the best channel. Some of them will have scanners in them. They'll scan the channels and show you what they see. And then from that screen, you can determine the best channel to choose. Uh, others will not. And of course, with those, you can just use a good free Wi-Fi scanner from the internet. In enterprise solutions, auto channel selection is improving continually. So it does keep getting better. Uh, when it first came out, it was, I would define it horrendous, uh, but it's getting better. And what do I mean by auto channel selection, by the way, when it comes to vendor equipment, we're talking about like Cisco's RRM, Aruba's features. Uh, most of the vendors have an auto channel selection feature. We're just using the generic term auto channel selection. If you implement it, know the following. How does the vendor make the selection? What's their algorithm? How are they making the choice? And what tuning capabilities are present? How do you fine tune the way that choice is made? What does the vendor recommend for that fine tuning? So take their recommendations, tune it, don't just accept defaults, and you may get acceptable results out of auto channel selection. But you always have to ask the question, is it working right now? Is it working right now? Do I have good channels? Is my CCI at a minimum? Are my clients working okay? Is everything all right? Does it look good to me? Now, if you know Wi-Fi, you can enable this enterprise grade auto channel selection and then use a site survey tool to go through and see what the network actually looks like. Now, most of the enterprise equipment today at the high level is going to have built in the option to import floor plans and, and see your channel map and so forth in that way. But you can always use a site survey tool and do a walkabout and gather the actual information from your environment, which will be better than anything simulated anyway. And from there, you can then say, is it really working? Does this look like a good design or are there areas that need tweaking? And then you might need to go into some of those areas and do some tweaking. But it's not just about now. It's also about tomorrow. It is auto channel selection, right? So something may happen in the environment that causes the algorithm to adjust channels. And now it might not be any good. And of course, it's not just tomorrow. It's always. In other words, when you're using auto channel selection, it's not as simple as saying, I've enabled it, it's on autopilot, I never have to analyze anything. Your job is still secure. You still need to go through periodically and make sure that everything is working well. Or at the very least, you need to have the right monitoring and alerts set up so you're being notified when problems start creeping in and then you can address those issues. Here's an example of a Wi-Fi scanner. So I've talked about it a few times. This happens to be Wi-Fi Explorer Pro. For the Mac OS, uh, you can get acrylic Wi-Fi for the PC, and there are many others as well. And so this tool simply uses your wireless interface in your laptop, and in this case, a MacBook, and scans for wireless networks. It's going to tell you the vendor if it can uh, resolve that. And it's going to tell you the channel that it's on, the channel width, the mode of operation, and the signal strength. So this is some very useful information to know. Um, this is where you come to find a channel that you might want to use. So for example, if this is a scan in 2.4 gigahertz at a specific location, and let's just take what's in view on my screen here. I can see a channel 11 at neg 90, a channel 11 at neg 75, a channel 6 at neg 88, and one at neg 26. And I see 8, I see 9, that makes me cry. I see 4, and I see channel 1 on neg 80. So in this particular space, if I'm just being forced to put an AP in here, I'm probably going to go with channel 11. And that's because... I'm getting two weaker signals from channel 11 that are in view. There's more below. I'm just talking about what we see here. I'm seeing weaker signals for those that I am seeing on channel 11. And so that's going to potentially help me with my decision here. And then on channel six, you can see I've got a very strong signal already there. So there's clearly already an AP within a few feet of where I am. And then on channel one, I've got uh, a neg 80 and then I've got a 40 megahertz channel down there on channel one that's out there. So this all just pains me and kind of forces me to pick channel 11 in this case. Now, if these are my APs, I'm not just picking channel 11. I'm going to go fix this horrible design. But assuming I'm in a multi-tenant facility or something like that, I've got to pick the best channel. That's probably my best bet. Now, here we see an example coming out of ComView for Wi-Fi, which is actually a wireless protocol analyzer from Tamosoft. 
And I really like it. I like its interface. I like how it works. Um, all of the protocol analyzers have their strengths. I love OmniPeaks dashboards. I love Air Magnet's built-in knowledge base. And um, I love ComView for Wi-Fi's interface in general, particularly for packet analysis. It, to me, it feels that it's more focused on packet analysis than all the dashboards. So it just depends on what you're doing. But one of the things you'll notice here is I've done a scan. As you can see that I've got a 40 megahertz channel. I've got two APs on channel three, one on channel eight. This is the ugliness of consumer auto channel selection. And I'll just kind of leave it at that. But that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing the results of consumer grade auto channel selection. And no, this isn't a really old picture. This may have been taken six months ago. All right. So it's not very old. And yes, this is a problem. All right. So let's get the top five takeaways for enterprise deployment. Number one, encourage the use of five gigahertz as much as possible. Why is that? We learned about those five gigahertz channels, right? There are many more of them. And so it's going to be much easier to design a network with multiple APs in five gigahertz. Number two, don't use 40 megahertz channels in 2.4 gigahertz. Why? Remember, there's really only room for one of them effectively without stepping on other channels. Three, use 80 megahertz channels rarely in five gigahertz and never use 160 megahertz channels. So the real decision in the vast majority of deployments is 20 or 40 megahertz, okay? Number four, know your environment. Look at the RF in your space before you make your decisions about channel selection. Know the environment you're dealing with and then select your channels. And finally, number five, know your system. If you're doing auto channel selection, make sure you understand how that system is going to work and make sure you're monitoring it and tuning it and getting the best out of it that you can. So these are the top five things. Use five gigahertz as much as you can. Don't use 40 megahertz in 2.4 gigahertz. Use 80 megahertz rarely, never 160 megahertz in five gigahertz. Know your RF environment and know your system and how it functions.